Putri. I'm glad you're here. It's wonderful to be back with you as we continue our series entitled Solid Ground. We have a goal this year, and that's to build on something solid. And especially as you watch the news, as you uh, consume content online, you can see that the world doesn't seem as certain or solid as it used to. And so we know as people who follow God, that we know that we have to build on something that is solid, something that no matter what happens to the economy, no matter what happens to our job, no matter what happens to uh, around us with a virus or a pandemic, that we know that we have something solid that we're building on. I love the fact that we said Christ alone, my cornerstone. Yes. You know, that cornerstone is what they would frame the foundation off of. If you had that cornerstone was set, you'd build off of that. And that's where the foundation was. And we're saying in 2022, Christ alone is my cornerstone. Not my 401k, not my job, not my cryptocurrency, not my home value, none of that. No, Christ is my foundation this year. And so we're teaching that. And we've started each week just diving into a particular topic. And we're the first week about belief. In the second week, we talked about prayer. Last week, about evangelism. And today, as uh, I look at the world around us, and then especially when I go to the gas pump, and then I start filling up my car with gas, I just look at my kids and say, there goes your inheritance. There goes your college fund. Just pumping it away, you know? And it's just say, bye, guys. I tried. I did the best I can. Then you go to the grocery store, not even to buy extravagantly. You're just buying ground beef and some uh, noodles. You know, you're just keeping it basic. And you're just thinking, things are getting more expensive. It's getting harder. And you start looking at financially. And then if we're going to talk about a, found, a, a foundation, I think that's one we need to talk about. And that's the question I want to ask this morning. And don't say it out loud, but just think about it. How strong is your financial foundation? That's a question. And some of the people in here elbowing their spouse. Yeah, it wouldn't be me. It's not my fault. It's not mine. Some of you are thinking right now, yeah, my foundation is like a house of cards. Those cards being credit cards. That's what my financial foundation is built on right now. Or maybe your financial foundation is built on the fact that you have a lot of student debt you're trying to pay off. Or maybe you're saying, hey, I'm just barely able to make the interest payment. Or maybe it's child support, or maybe it's uh, a back taxes that you're paying, or maybe it's just simply the fact that the cost of living has gotten so high and expensive that it's just getting harder, harder and harder to make it. Don't raise your hands, but think about this. In your mind right now, how many of you think if you just had more money, that would solve your problems? Don't raise your hand, but just think for a second. And be honest with yourself. This is between you and yourself. How many of you think, if I just had more money, that would solve my problems? Just think about it for a second. Just think about it. Because if we're honest with ourselves, at times, that will, that's what we think. Because it comes out of our emotions. Man, if I just made an extra twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, this gas problem wouldn't be a problem. You know, this broken down vehicle that doesn't really work would not be a problem. Hey, I would own a home, and I wouldn't be paying all these astronomical rent prices if I just had a little bit more money. But here's what happens when you and I say that money would solve our problems. That means money is our master. And money is supposed to be a tool. But for many of us, it's not a tool. It's a trap. Because it's really easy to get in debt. As a matter of fact, they've made it fun to get in debt. 
It is a whole lot of fun to buy stuff you can't afford because they will give it to you. Like you don't have the money in the bank, but Visa says no problem. American Express says that's no problem. The car dealerships, like you can't afford this, but it's still no problem. We live, what a country that we live in where you can go and buy stuff you can't afford and you know you won't pay, be able to pay it off, but they will still let you have it. Like that for me, was like growing up going to Toys R Us. Man, just walking down that aisle, and your parents are like, you can look, but you ain't having it. And now, mom and dad aren't around, and American Express says, I can have it. And Discover says, I can have it. And Visa says, I can have it. They're the best parents ever. Those are the parents that I always wanted, the ones that say, yes, you can have it. But what happens is many of us are building a weak financial foundation. President Herbert Hoover said this, by the time you start making ends meet, someone's moved the end. And that's what you feel like. You say, man, I, I, I just felt like, man, if we got here, then we'd be okay. And it just seems like we're always trying to catch up. And there's no stress like financial stress. Yeah. There is nothing that puts a bigger strain on a marriage and a relationship than financial strain. Because you're frustrated, but your problem is you're not really frustrated with that person. It's just you don't know what to do. And, and, and that person is not evil because they went and did their nails or they, they went and played around to golf. That's not evil. But what happened is when you're just living under this financial pressure, you're just like, well, that's not important. Why did you do that? And why did you buy this? We have different values. But I believe that God wants you to have peace and relief from your financial stress. That's not how God wants you and I to live. He doesn't want you and I living with that burden. As a matter of fact, Proverbs says this, a good man leaves an inheritance, not just to his children, but to his children's children. To be able to leave an inheritance means you have to have a little bit extra, right? So what do we do to be able to get to that point where we have a strong financial foundation? Now, my goal is actually to help you because I did not grow up learning good biblical financial decision making. I didn't learn that. It was through the school of hard knocks. It was through the school of having to go through some pain when it came to finances. And so I'm here telling you, I know what it's like having that feeling of when you're trying to get to your job and the vehicle you're trying to get to work breaks down. And now you're going to be late for work. So you get out of the car, leave it to the side of the road, and you have to deal with it later. And you've got to run to work to make it on time. I know that feeling. I know the feeling of when you're going to buy groceries and you get to the counter and you put your card down and they say, sorry, sir, it's declined. And you have to push the grocery basket to the side and have to say, okay, well, we'll figure it out. And you go home. I know the feeling of what it's like to pray that your older siblings grow so that you can have their clothes because you're not getting new clothes. So the only way you get clothes is handy down clothes. I know the feeling. I know the feeling of telling your friends, hey, let me buy you guys a, a Starbucks. Let, let's go. I'll, I'll treat. And you get there and you put your card down. It says declined. And then one of your friends is kind of like trying to protect you. And it's like, it's okay, Makai, I got it. I know the feeling of being in debt where all it seems that you're barely able to make the interest payment and you're not even doing that. I know what it means to be sent to collections. I know the feeling. I don't sit here saying, well, do it my way. Look at me. I'm happy, wealthy, and wise. No, I've, I've learned from the school of hard knocks. And I want to help this morning. Because it's not getting cheaper. It's not like, and that's the funny thing. In the summer, we were told inflation won't get higher than 5%. It's, it's going to stop at 5%. We're at 75 mm, getting real close to 8 And it's no sign of slowing. So if that's not going to change, and your boss, God bless his heart, can only do so much, what do Christians do? I'm glad you asked. Because this morning, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. Would you write that down? The best thing money can buy is financial freedom. And that's what you and I need, financial freedom. You see, we live in a system that is designed to actually keep you and I just working, just, just making payments like that's normal. Can I tell you, making car payments actually isn't normal. Making credit card interest only payments is not normal. That's not the way. And yet many of us have just assumed that that's normal. We just, we just have these bills that come in from Visa, MasterCard, American Express. That's just normal. You just pay those. And I just pay rent. I never actually own anything. Somebody else owns it. 
And here's what's crazy. If you don't own anything, you are actually making money for the person who does. Isn't that crazy? You are making somebody else money because you don't own it. That place you live, if you don't own it, you are making your landlord a lot of money. You are paying down his mortgage, and he's getting a little bit extra on the side. And he doesn't have a liability. He has an asset when he goes to the bank. The bank doesn't see that as a liability. They see that as an asset, even though he owns several hundred thousand, maybe a million dollars on that property. Now, I want to show you some things from Scripture, because you're saying, okay, that's great, Micaiah. How do I get this so-called financial freedom? So glad you asked. Take your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to go to a familiar passage. We just heard recently a great message about this same character a couple of weeks ago. If you missed it, go check it out on YouTube or podcast. The great prophet Elijah, he comes onto the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17, just kind of like a bolt, out of, bolt of lightning, just out of nowhere, Elijah comes on the scene. And he tells King Ahab, it's not going to rain for three and a half years unless I say so. And after that, he disappears. And in verses 1 down through verse number 8, he goes to a brook. And at this brook, God takes care of Elijah by sending ravens. You know those black birds we see sometimes flying around? God used ravens to bring Elijah food to this stream, this brook. And Elijah is just kind of living off grid. No internet, no cell phone service. Just got himself a nice van down by the river, all right? That's just what he's doing. And he's having a great time. And then all of a sudden, he sees this brook dry up, and God says something powerful to him. And let's pick it up, verse number 8. 1 Kings 17, verse number 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Interesting. Uh, we used to have a person in our church. His name was Mike Wallace, and you remember him. He was a single guy for a long time, and he was always praying for that rich, young widow. That's, that's what he would tell me. He's like, hey, have you been praying for me to find that rich, young widow? And uh, many of us are thinking, well, God's going to send Elijah to that rich, young widow. Notice verse number 9. Let's continue reading the Bible. Arise, go to Zarephath, or excuse me, verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there. There was a widow. What's the widow doing? Gathering sticks. Wait a minute. Why doesn't the widow have her servants doing it? Because she's, God wouldn't send Elijah to some really poor, destitute widow, would he? Yeah, he would. This widow is so poor, she has to go gather some sticks. Doesn't even, doesn't even have any in the house. So she's gathering sticks. And he called her and said... Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. I know exactly why Elijah asked for a cup of water. God just told Elijah, there's a famine, there's no food in the land. And here he comes to this person and he sees the person that's supposed to provide for him and he's chickening out. You ever felt bad about asking somebody for something? I do it all the time. I have the hardest time asking anybody for help or anything I need. It's just, it's very hard for me to ask somebody. I'll be at a restaurant and it is the waiter's job to bring me a, a, a cup of water or to refill my drink. And I still, I just have the hardest time asking. I just, I just, it's like, I'm going to still tip them regardless, but it's like, I have a hard time. So imagine, here's what Elijah's doing. Elijah sees this woman, sees her clothes, sees the rags, sees she's looking for sticks. And he's like, oh, really God? I don't want to be that pastor. Like, send me to the rich person at church to ask for some help to build the building. Not the poorest person. The person who I know is struggling. You see, widows had no way of getting a job. There was, there was, no, there was no welfare system. This is very destitute. If you are a widow in the Bible days, that's, that's a very, there's, there's nobody poor. And so, he asked for some water. Elijah's trying to get up the courage to really ask for what he's supposed to ask. And then notice verse 11. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And here's what Elijah says. 
And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me first a small cake from it and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. Here's a woman that can relate with us when it's hard financially. She just has a little bit of flour. I have kind of bigger hands for a guy my size, right? I have decent sized hands. Um, And so I grabbed a handful of flour. I can fit about a half a cup of flour in my hand. She said in scripture, I have a handful of flour. This is a lady's hand. If you're sitting next to your wife, grab your wife's hand, okay? Just grab it and just look at it for a second. Come on, come on. Some of you are grabbing the dude's hand. You're like, you got a woman's hands, you know? That's, that's kind of mean, you know? And uh, so just look at that hand. That's not very much flour. How big of a cake are you really going to build? Bake, build, bake. You're talking about just a small little, I mean, Come on, we all like going to uh, uh, oh, the restaurant that has those cheese rolls and everything, and we go to Red Lobster and get those. The, it wouldn't even be that size. You're talking about hardly anything. That's her last meal. And how good is flour with oil? No salt, no sugar, no yeast. I mean, for your last meal, you want at least a good last meal. This is just some flour, some oil, and maybe she'll put some water in there and make not even pita bread. This is just going to be a flat, hard, stale piece of bread. This woman's bad situation. And I bet you there are people in this room that are, you're kind of there too. You're like, you know, it's middle of the month. I got rent coming up. I got bills coming up. Car, every light is on in the car. I don't know if I can make it. And you come to church and you want to give to God. You want to give to kingdom causes. And you're just thinking, I don't know how to do it. But the secret's here. And I love what God does next. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of the Lord, uh, the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Isn't God good? That God can provide even when we think there's no way. Yeah. Now let's break down this passage. And I'm going to get real practical and then we're going, to, we're, going to, you, we're going to work through this, okay? First of all, would you write this down? When it comes to your savings and my savings, spend wisely. Spend wisely. And you can tell right off the bat, this woman had been spending wisely. Because if that's all she had left, she had been rationing meals. You ever been there? Or you just say, hey, we're going to... It's getting more expensive. So my wife did this the other day. She said, hey, meat's getting real expensive. So guys, enjoy the meat because we're switching to tofu. I said, foo, we ain't. <laughs> no, we're not. I don't eat that stuff. That's not meat. What are you talking about? We're switching to tofu. She's like, there's a meat shortage. It's expensive. I said, we will kill the neighbor's cat. I don't like the cat anyway. We will grind that thing up. It's all good, all right? Man. No, you, you, you get it. Here, here's this passage where she had spent wisely. What happens is oftentimes we, if we're honest, we don't spend wisely. And when it comes to our savings, we have to step back and just do a little personal inventory and just say, hey, how am I spending my finances? You see, we all have a getting goal, but what is your giving goal? And if you're going to spend wisely, the first thing to do is you say, I'm going to put God first. God is first. Um, you say, Micaiah, you've been in some bad financial straits. Yes, I've been in bad financial straits. But there is one principle I've learned along the way that saved me. And it's the one of putting God first. And I know you're like, yeah, I knew it. First time I come to church, you're going to talk about money. Yep, I knew it was coming. I knew it. This is why I don't go to church, because you guys always talk about money. No, it's not that we're talking about money. It's that I know how we feel about money. Did you catch what Elijah said, do not be afraid? Do you know how finances and fear go together? They really do, don't they? So Elijah's first word is, hey, don't be afraid. My first word to you is, don't be afraid. This is where we're at financially, and we need to say, I'm just going to start spending wisely, because nobody told you that. The moment you go to college, you just get handed a credit card, and you just start swiping. But we've got to learn to put God first. 
Let me ask you this question. Do you pray about it before you pay for it? Do you pray about it before you pay for it? Or you're just like, no, 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 I'm going to go buy it. No, no. How about, how many times, because God is a good father, how many times has God said, you know what, I actually wanted to give it to you? Yeah. And so this is the thing. Before uh, uh, Christmas comes, I always have to check in with my wife because I'm like, hey, she'll, she'll have these things she wants to buy. And I'm like, hey, look, um, what are you thinking about buying? Because I'm probably going to get it for you for Christmas. And so instead of her buying it, it's just like, I already got it. I believe God wants to do the same. That God is saying, hey, no, would you pray about it? Because I want to provide this and I want to provide it through someone. You see, sometimes we think God won't provide because we don't just stop and say, Lord, I need this. God, would you provide this? I can go buy it right now, but God, I just want to see how you'll provide. I can't tell you how many times we practice this principle in our household and God has just shown up. I don't make car payments. Both my cars, they're older, they're used. They were given to me. Both of them. One's a 2013, one's a 2006. Why? I can go out and buy a car or I could sit back and say, God, I know that I would rather give $300 a month instead of a car payment. I would rather give it to your kingdom causes. And so God, would you, you see my need, but here's what I want to do with that money. God, would you bless? Would you take care of? And God has worked things out. I'm telling you, if you would stop and just say, Lord, here's some things our family needs. Here's some things that we want. Here's some things we want to do. Don't you believe you have a good God who wants to prepare, uh, bless you with it? But we need to step back and just say, I'm going to put God first. And I'm going to pray about it. Notice this. Too often today, people go broke today because they want to look rich. We live in a country where people are going broke because they want to look rich. It's so funny. The amount of money we will spend to look wealthy. It's turning into something that our children are just like, we're just picking it up. And, and, and let me tell you a funny story to illustrate this. I had a 1984 Honda Accord. It was my first car, blue velvet interior, okay? That was the first car I had when I bought it in 2002. This car was already 18 years old. Man, this car was great. I paid $1,200 for it. It was a manual stick shift. This thing was great. And you could just drive it forever. And uh, I was paying my own way through college. But instead of paying my payment to my school bill, I wanted a sound system. Here's what's ironic. The tuition, I didn't have money for tuition, but I had money for Best Buy to go get a sound system. And, and mine was a CD player, you know, like you get out of the car, but before we get out to go to the restaurant or go to the mall, I'd push the little button, the face plate comes off, you stick it in your pocket because you don't want anybody stealing it. My friends would all laugh. They were like, do you see your car? Nobody's going to steal from this car. This is garbage. No, but this CD player, man, no, no, that, they were like, that costs more than the whole car. Exactly. Take the face plate with me. Do you see how we don't spend wisely? We make foolish decisions instead of just stopping and praying about and saying, Lord, is this something you want for me? Let me spend wisely. Not only spend wisely, save diligently. Save diligently. I'm going to break down just easy way to handle your money. Okay. Think about what you make. First 10%, that's God's. Give the first right, first thing. The first check we cut, and yes, we still write a check to God. There's just something about that habit of writing the check to God. The first check goes to God, 10%, right off the top. That's God's. Even though there's been months where we're like, man, how are we going to be able to give to God? I don't know, but I want God's blessing on the other 90. Yeah. So I'm going to return what's God's first, but then second, you say, yeah, then you pay your bills. No. Do you know how rich people got rich? Their money is making them money while they sleep. Think about that for a second. You want to earn more money, you want to make more money? When you are sleeping, is your money making you more money? So pay yourself 10%. Pay yourself. How much of your money is actually making you money? A lot of times we're like, well, I gave God and I live on 90. That's good. You got one of them down, but you haven't paid yourself. You say, well, the, the job, it kind of does this matching thing. No, no, no. You pay yourself. You invest into money that's making you money, and then you take 10% and put into savings for a rainy day. Because here's the thing that I know that happens. You're going to give to God. You're ready to give to God. You're ready to bring that tithe check to God. And then all of a sudden, the car breaks down, and you need a new engine. All of a sudden, the son breaks his arm, and now you got a doctor's bill. That's always going to come up. And what happens is we take it from God instead of taking it from savings. Because that's what your savings is for. Your savings is for the emergency. But we don't have an emergency fund. Because we don't think that, hey, 10% is God's. 10% is making me money. 10% is savings. And I live on 70 
I live on 70. We live in a world that says, no, 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 we live on 120. That's standard. People, people live on way more than they actually bring in. And so we need to step back and say, wait a minute, I need to save diligently. She had been saving. This is everything. And she's even letting him know that, hey, this is all I have left. There's not much left. What are we going to do with this? You know, many times we're intimidated to save. But you and I, we grow physically gradually. Your savings grow gradually. You're looking to just overnight, man, I'm just hoping that this thing hits big. Let's play the lottery. Let's go all in on this random cryptocurrency. Let's just hope it lands big and we hit and we win. No, no, no. Let your savings grow gradually. Compound interest. Some of us are in this habit that we think, oh, I just have to make more. That's all that would happen. That goes back to my original question. Some of you just think, if I just had more money, that would solve all my problems. God can take care of your problems. But the problem is that we don't understand and let me just be honest. My house could have sold for more, but I took a lesser offer. You say, why? Because it would have put me in a higher tax bracket. I would have made less. Hmm. Why, would, why do I want to give more to Uncle Sam? He's not managing it well, so I can't trust him with it. So it's instead, it's like, hey, talk to my CPA. Da, 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 compute, what, what, what's the best thing? This is the best thing. There we go. All right. Perfect. You see, too often what happens is we think, man, I need to make more. No, you end up paying more in taxes. Now, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And yet we can learn to live on less. You say, man, I don't really like that living, learning on less. I know I'm going to use a word. It's a cuss word. You're not going to like it. It's going to make you visibly angry. It makes me angry every time I hear it. I hate saying this word. You ready for it? Budget. Oh, I don't like that word. Oh, I do not like that word. I don't like to live on a budget. My wife loves the word budget <laughs> because now she's not the bad guy. The budget's the bad guy. Hey, honey, can we go eat out? I want to take you out on a date. Let me check and see if it's in the budget. It's not in the budget. I hate the budget. I just want to go out and have coffee and hang out with you. But really, I want coffee. No, I really want to hang out with you. <laughs> but it's not in the budget. You know what a budget does? It takes the emotion out of it. Yeah. Finance is emotional. Come on, let's be honest. It's emotional. We're talking about our money. That represents hours of your life you never get back. So it's an emotional thing. A budget takes the emotion out of it. Set a budget and live by the budget. Then you tell your children, it's not that daddy doesn't want to get you new J's. It's daddy has bills and we pay those first. Daddy ties. We give to God. We honor that. We do this first. And if there's money left over and we can afford it, that's great. We can do it. But you know something in our culture we've lost the joy of? We have lost the joy of wanting something. And I know immediately you're like, no, I want a lot of things. No, 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 let me finish. We've lost the joy of wanting something, of waiting for something, and working for something. There is a joy in that. There is a joy in saying, man, I want that car. Man, you go by the dealership and say, one day I'm going to have that car. And you wait for it. You want it and you work for it. You know what a lesson we teach our children when we make them want something, wait for something to work for it? They value it, they appreciate it, but we live in a culture that's instant gratification, so when you have instant gratification, you don't, you don't feel that same responsibility to it. And we live in that culture and you say, hey, how is this gonna help me in my finances? Because we need to get back to that discipline and there's joy in wanting something. Some of us, we've, we've lost that joy in just waiting and working for something. So we've said it. We're breaking it down. Spend wisely, save diligently. Number three, give generously. You know, there is two types of people. This woman is a different type of person. There is those types of people that they're in on something. And then there's the type of people that are all in. This widow wasn't just in. She was all in. Judas Iscariot was in among the 12, but he was not all in. This woman's all in. She's saying, hey, this is my last meal, but you can have it. And notice, Elijah didn't tell her that God was going to bless it until after she gave it. It wasn't until she said, I'm going to give to God first, that then God said, okay, there's a reward for that type of obedience. Yeah. Their reward is, I'm going to take care of you for a long time. You see, because she said, I'm going to be generous. Think about this for the moment. What is the best gift you've ever received? 
I mean, think about it. What's the best gift you've ever given? Maybe you say, hey, it was the fact that God gave me a child, or maybe it's the fact that somebody gave me this expensive car, or maybe I got this beautiful outfit, or maybe I got this new phone. You and I, we have a gift that stands out in our mind. They were like, that was the best gift ever. Just, just top 10. I don't have time, but I was going to go around the room and just ask you, what was that best gift? Actually, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's just see. Well, best gift, best gift, best gift. Rod, let's start with you. What's the best gift you've ever given? <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, my sister purchased me a car when I was 16 years old before she had a car. What's your sister's number? Where's she at? We, we, a couple of us want to talk to her. All right, let's go to the next one. Maggie, what's your best gift you've ever received? salvation. Oh, Jesus Duke. Okay. Spiritual people. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Here we go. Oscar, let's go to you. My wife. Oh, oh, somebody's scoring points. There we go. Points. We're going to come on. Everybody's all spiritual over there. Let's come to this side. Brenna, what's the best gift you've ever been given? Um, I'm going to go with this. The new oh, phone. her phone, her phone. There we go. There we go. Josh, how about you? My son, Benjamin. Oh, that is awesome. I love this. Last one, last one. Ethan, here we go. Uh, Nintendo 64 when I was 11 years old. There we go. Nintendo 64. We've all been given a gift. And it stands out in our mind. It's a great gift. We love it. It's memorable. Now think about this. God said the greatest gift that he's ever given us is Jesus, his son, salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave. God is a giver. You and I have the heart of generosity, but oftentimes we fail to be generous. And think about this. This woman was willing to give everything. Yeah. It's exactly like Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. And he's saying it's like a treasure that a man finds in a field. And then he goes and sells all that he has, everything that he has, his houses, his electronics, his vehicles, his business. He sells all of it to go buy the treasure. There's another man. He finds a pearl of great price in a market far, far away. And he does the same. And God is saying that that's how valuable the kingdom is. That God's kingdom is worth you and I selling everything for and saying, I'm going all in. Because that's how valuable it is. The problem is, you and I don't see that value. You see, this widow saw that this is a man of God. She even says it. She even says it in the passage. And let's back up because we've got to see it. She saw a value. So she said, verse 12, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have any bread. She saw immediately, this is a prophet, this is a man of God. She saw something that most people couldn't see. And she said, if this is a man of God, there's something valuable, even though it's not visible. And you and I, when we look at giving to kingdom causes and giving to God, culture, relatives, we don't always see the value. We see the value of a Nintendo 64. We're like, yeah, that's awesome, man. Hopefully you got GoldenEye. That was the best game on the Nintendo 64. Maybe that car, everybody's like, man, it's an awesome car. What a gift. Children, what a gift. Uh, spouse, what a gift. Uh, salvation, what a gift. That's right. But we're selling everything. This woman wasn't just in. She was all in. And God blesses her because she's all in. Are you all in? This woman was in. You see, tithing doesn't make me a giver. And a lot of people say, I'm generous. I'm a tither. Okay. I have a 2013 Toyota Highlander. And since Scott is wearing a 49ers jersey, I'm going to pick on Scott. Let's say Scott borrows my Toyota Highlander. And he borrows it for a week. He has a much nicer car than mine. I don't know why he'd want to borrow mine, but let's just say Scott borrows mine. And the week later, he knocks on the door and says, Micaiah, and he's all excited. I'm like, hey, Scott, you are more bubbly and excited than normal. And he's like, yeah, because I got you a gift, man. And I'm like, really? Oh, Scott, oh, you shouldn't have. And then he's like, yeah, come out here and see. I, you've always wanted it. And I come outside, and I see in my driveway my Highlander. Except it has a big, giant red bow, like it's a December to remember. And he's like, ta-da. And I was like, bro, you can't give me what was already mine. And he's like, yeah, don't you love it? I was like, yeah, thanks. Thank you for the bow. That's the only thing I didn't have was the bow. But how many times have I done that to God? Like, all right, God, here's... 
I'm doing you a big one, God. Man, you're going to be so happy with me. I'm going to give you back 10%. And God's like, that was already mine, Micaiah. Yeah. I already laid claim to it. You're just giving me, because here's the thing. The tithe is not the ceiling of generosity. It is the floor of generosity. It's where we start. Here's the thing. It's not that it needs to come through the church. We're building a multi-million dollar complex. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. I'm not really worried about it. God's got that. That's his. God's will is his bill. But there are people in your life. Maybe when you go to a restaurant, you're going to look over. You're going to see a family. They're sharing a meal. They're looking at the ticket. And they're thinking, ah, let's share. Let's split. Why don't you buy their lunch? Why don't you be that person? You're at Starbucks. And you're the drive through And you see the person behind them. And they're looking and they're yelling and you can see them digging in the cushions. They're looking for quarters to pay for that Starbucks. That single mom desperately needs that Starbucks. Pay for it. Pay for it. Why, why do we got to be thinking that everything, yes, tied to God, but yet generosity should be all over our life. Everywhere we go, we should just be generous people. Any opportunity that we have just to give to others. We should look for it. Maybe you got a neighbor who needs to make a car payment or a rent payment. You say, I got you. And they were like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I got it. I think people would look at Christianity totally different if we were like that. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a special tithe that you would bring. But that tithe was actually every seven years. You'd bring a tithe that the priest would then take and they would pay the poor in the community. That's what the priest, every seven years, you would bring a special tithe. And the priest would take that tithe and go out into the community and find the poor people and just give them money. You know, we've lost that. It's not just that, oh, the church needs this money. No. God's going to take care of us. He's good to us. You should tithe. You should give through your church. But it's all about saying, Lord, I'm going to get involved in this. You see, the devil wants you to believe that you have to be rich to give. That's what he wants you to think. When I get rich one day, then I'll give. This woman wasn't. It wasn't like, hey, when I open up my own bakery shop, Elijah, I will hook you up. I will make cronuts for you. I will make baguettes for you. I will make the most delicious cakes for you, but come back when my business is going and I'm doing better financially. She didn't do that, did she? She said, I'm going to eat my last meal. But yeah, Elijah, you can have it. Okay, I get that story if she didn't have a son. But we often forget about the fact that she has a son. What single mom gives up her son's last meal? That is a different level of sacrifice. Because every mom in this room, you know you would die first. You would take a bullet. You would take anything for your child. But here she looks at her son and says, it's okay. We're taking care of the man of God. Wow. That's incredible. I'm telling you, that sacrifice and that type of faith brings God's attention and God's reward. And it's so much so. You have your Bible with you or your phone app with the Bible on it. Go to Luke 4. You need to go to Luke 4. This is powerful. Because Jesus is talking thousands of years later. Jesus is talking. This woman is long gone. But notice something powerful. In Luke 4, verse 25, but I tell you, this is Jesus talking, that I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. There were lots of widows. When the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Seraphath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. One word in there that changes everything about this whole text. You see, we think that God was trying to provide for Elijah. We think that God was trying to say, hey, this situation dried up. That job's done. That season's over. Move on. Move to Austin, Texas. That's a new tech startup. Come on. Got to get out of California. Silicon Valley's old news. I got to move. No, no, no. It wasn't that Elijah needed to be taken care of. The one word sent, God was taking care of the widow through Elijah but the widow still had to put God first. She had a part in this. And God's like, hey, if you act in obedience, I'm gonna bless you far in and above. And notice this as we close. Only by giving was she able to receive more than she already had. 
It was only by giving that she got more than she already had. How much more? The famine lasted for another two years and she didn't have to worry about another meal. 365 multiplied times three. That's a lot of meals. That's a lot of bread. It was so much so that she even tells Elijah, hey, why don't you move in and build a house on top of my house? And Elijah lives with them. But here's the thing. We think about, oh, if I give to God and God is going to take care of me, God's going to take care of this woman in bigger ways. We don't have time. It's already 1131 unless you got time. Do you got time? Tell me if you got time. Oh, amen. I like this church. I'm going to keep coming back here. Praise the Lord. Verse number 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was sore that there was no breath left in him. The widow's son dies. God, really? Really, God? Has this woman been through enough? She comes to Elijah and says, hey, my son's died. And then Elijah says, figuratively, hold my beer, hold my wine, hold my flask. I don't know. He just... He went up and then he prayed. And the woman's son came back. Not only did God take care of her for two years, but God knew, hey, one day your son's going to be sick and you're going to want this prophet around. But it started with her first doing something for the kingdom. And I know that's where we have the hardest problem and Satan is telling you that is dumb, that is foolish. And I know, I know it's hard to give up everything. But God is doing something special. In 2016, God laid it on Jane and I's heart to give $10,000 to the church. We originally didn't have the money, but we, that was our entire savings. That was our entire savings. It was $10,000 what we had in the savings. And we were going to give 1000 and then we prayed. And as we prayed, God said, add a zero to the 1000 And we emptied out our savings account. That was such a huge step in 2016. We, the church wasn't giving us a salary at the time. We were just like, all right, God, we're going all in on everything we got. This same season, God did something like that again. And Jane and I, once again, we stepped up to the plate. We sold the house and we're like, okay, we're giving this to God. Can I tell you, the house was bigger than $10,000, but the feeling is still the same. Satan wants to get you trapped into thinking, this is, it's never going to get better than this. This $10,000 is never going to get better. And Jane and I, we just had to encourage ourselves because we're like, what are we going to do? And everybody's asking, and I appreciate it. Everybody's like, where are you going to move? And I always say, your house. I got a tent. You have a backyard. Problem solved. But it doesn't get easier. I once went to my mom. I'm closing with this. I went to my mom because I was discouraged because we paid our own way through college. My dad was a pastor, poor, seven kids, you know, and and in college is paying your way. Things are hard. So you call your mom, just kind of vent it a little bit. I'm like, mom, I can't pay my school bill. It's expensive. I'm working this job. Minimum wage at this time was $6.75, and I was making $7.25. It's just expensive. And she was like, you know, whenever I'm in those moments, I look for somebody who's worse off than me, and I try to bless them. I can't help myself, but I can help somebody else. And I said, that is like backwards. <laughs> like, I don't get that. And she said, yeah, it's advancing backwards. I said, this still doesn't make any sense. I need money. Now I'm going to go spend money. The first point was spend wisely. And what do you mean? I'm going to go do something nice for this person. She said, yeah, go find the person on that college campus that's struggling a little bit. And there was a guy. His name was Daniel Blankenship. I knew the guy immediately. Not a lot of friends. Kind of different. Just a different guy. He's from Louisiana, just did a lot of different things. He came to California, just, the guy had a lot of issues. And I said, hey, Daniel, you want to go to Chili's? And Daniel was like, I'd love to go to Chili's. So we went to Chili's, sitting down, he's like, what can I order? And I was like, can't pay the school bill, but whatever you want, man. He's like, really? So I, fajitas are $17. I'm going to order a fajita, and I'm going to order a drink. And I was like... Yeah, I'll have water, lemon, three packets of sugar. <laughs> I'm making lemonade. Uh, and I watch him eat his fajitas. Daniel and I got to talking. And Daniel told me he's a pastor's son too. I didn't know that. He said, yeah, my dad's a pastor in Louisiana. I was like, I'm glad I took you out to lunch. I didn't know that. He was actually a very intelligent person. And people with such a high IQ, often socially awkward, I actually think he was on the spectrum a little bit, but he was brilliant. People just didn't know how to deal with him. That year finished, 
And Daniel moved on, joined the military. I was thinking, I took him out to lunch. It wasn't like somebody magically showed up and paid my school bill or anything. I still had to work the same job. As a matter of fact, years went by and I had forgotten all about Daniel Blankenship. And then in 2013, Jane and I are praying, we need to start a church. I'm like, okay, we're going to go plant this church. I'm going to call up some buddies who are pastors from college. It's 11 years later from when I took Daniel Blankenship out to eat. So I call up a friend in Sacramento. His name's Chris Armour. I said, hey, Chris, we were good friends at college. Hey, why don't I come up? And this is code for, I'm going to come to your church. You're going to give me money. Can I present the ministry to you? Can I present this opportunity to you? And it was a great opportunity. Basically, hey, man, I need money to fund this church plant. And he said, hey, um, I'd love to have you come up, Makai, but our church has got a new pastor and you have to run it by him. I was like, okay, all right, well, give him all my information. Give him, give him everything and just have him call me or I'll email him or I'll drive up. We'll meet. We'll have coffee. We'll go to Chili's. I don't know. We'll do something. I get a call from a pastor in Sacramento and he says, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And he says, I'm the guy taking over for Chris Armour's church. My name is Pastor Blankenship. I know that name. He said, you know, my son, not really walk with the Lord, join the military, but he always talked about you. What? He said, at that college, you were the only person that was nice to him. He said, you, one time, and he said, you had this really nasty car with a nice sound system, and he's like, yeah, that was you. <laughs> yeah, push the button, take the CD player, put it in your pocket, go into the restaurant. He said, you took my son out, I appreciate that. Uh, you don't have to present your ministry. We're going to support your ministry. Twelve years prior, I thought I was just taking somebody to lunch. And God was like, no, you're not. You're planting seeds. That it's going to take a couple years. But I know when you really need that harvest. I know when you're really going to need that money. I know when the rent is due. I know when the medical bill is due. I know when exactly the right time. And right now you're sitting there and you're saying, God, I don't know if I can trust you. And God is saying, yes, you can. You sow that seed and I'm going to show up in your future when you really need it. Right now you think you need to go buy a pair of shoes, go buy a new car. And God is saying, there's going to be a hospital bill. There's going to be a lawyer payment. There's going to be a car payment. There's going to be a house payment. There's something so much bigger. But you got to trust me right now in this season. And right now, if you can trust me, I'm going to take care of you in a far bigger way. It's having a kingdom concept because God does see currency like you and I see currency. God sees it in the way of sowing and reaping. And there's a law of sowing and reaping. You get more when you sow than you, what you sow. God's going to give you more back. And I know Christians have abused that, but what I'm telling you this morning is that when you say, God, yeah, I'm going to sow into my neighbor's life. I'm going to sow into my marriage. You may say, man, my marriage is struggling right now. You sow in even though you don't feel like it. You sow into your children, even though your children, you're struggling with them. You sow into your boss, even though you say, man, we're just not getting along. I don't know if this is going to work out. You sow, you give, you go first, because it wasn't until she gave that God gave her more than she ever could have had. And God sustained her for two years. And my friend, God wants to sustain you as well. You see, if you live for having it all, then what you have will never be enough. We've got to learn God, help me to put you first. You can take care of everything else. A friend of mine who also visited our church years ago hit me up on Facebook last week and said, Makai, have you read this book, Kingdom Builders? I said, no. He said, I'm going to send you a copy. I got it on Thursday. I finished it on Friday. Such a good book. I bought a bunch of copies for you. Because what we're about to do is a big kingdom concept. We're building God's kingdom, not my kingdom. We're building God's kingdom. And we're not just building it at Southridge. We're building it all over the Bay Area. You see, if you just think it's about Southridge, you're missing the point. This is so much bigger. This is the fact that there are 7.2 million people in the Bay Area that need Jesus Christ. And we're going to be the lighthouse that reaches them. But how are we going to do that? It's kingdom building. So I have a book out there, and it's 150 pages. Easy read. You can finish in less than a day. I'd like for every household to grab it on your way out. I bought it for you. Grab a book. And if we run out of books, I'll buy some more because I think this will inspire you in this season. Because I don't want our church struggling financially. I don't believe that that's God's will for you. Because if you learn to spend wisely, to save diligently, and to give generously, 
God's got you. God's got you. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we know the fact that you love us. You proved it. You gave. There's no greater proof of love than when someone gives. And so, Father, we thank you that you gave your son Jesus. We weren't deserving of it. We were in worse shape than this widow with a child. But yet you came down with your love. God, we thank you for that. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here this morning. You say, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I hear you talking about it. I hear you saying about how Jesus loves us, dying on the cross for us. But if I were to die today, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. But today I want to put my faith and trust in him. And I want to receive him. I want to go all in with this thing with Jesus. And maybe God's speaking to your heart right now. And he's telling you, you need to say yes to God. You've been running from him. You've been away from him. And God is saying, come back right now. Take that first step. You initiate. You obey. And God will take care of the outcome. If you say, I need to receive Jesus Christ, my Savior, with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, but you slip up your hand and say, hey, I want to I receive Christ today. Is that you? Would you lift up your hand? Is that you? Anybody? Amen. God bless you. I see that hand in the back. God bless you. We're going to pray a prayer together for this person who's raised her hand saying, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Would you pray this small prayer? It's not the words, it's the heart. Would you just pray something like this? Dear Lord, I repent of my sin. I know I've done some things I'm not proud of, but I thank you for sending Jesus who shed his blood on the cross that forgives me and washes me clean. I will receive the forgiveness of sins so that I could be your child and received into your family. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you pray that? If you slip up your hand, you say, I just prayed that. Would you just pray that prayer? Amen. God bless you. Can we celebrate with those ones who just said yes to Jesus? That's the most important thing. When people pray and receive Christ as their Savior. But maybe you're here and you're saying, I'm struggling financially. <laughs> Can you pray for me, Pastor? I, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Yeah, let's pray for you. Heads bowed and eyes closed one more time. I, I've been where you're at. You say, I need help financially. You slip up your hands. Can I pray for you? You say, I need, I need help. I see you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for, that's a hard thing to be honest about. I see that hand. Amen. I see that hand. Struggling financially. Amen. I see that. It's not that you don't want to work. You don't want to do it. It's just, it's hard. It's hard. We want to pray for these. We want to be a church that supports, a church that loves, helps. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. And God, we're asking you to provide for these four that raised their hands. These four that said, Lord, they are struggling financially. I saw the hands of these four. I know them, God. They're good people. You're your people. People that have put you first. They're worthy of the blessing. God, would you provide for their businesses? Would you provide health? Would you provide their uh, sanity during the season? God, would you put, put them at peace? that you're going to provide for them. Would you show up in miraculous ways this week? Father, we thank you for your provision. Your word promises that you've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. We are the righteous. We're your children. You said you've never forsaken them. God, we claim your promises that you are going to provide. And so, Father, would you meet the needs? Put those people that have raised their hands saying we're in a desperate financial fix. Would you put them at peace, God? Help them to know that you're taking care of it. Lord, we thank you for a good Sunday. We thank you for a time we can gather. Father, we have brothers and sisters in Ukraine that they're nervous this morning. Father, we're here worried about how to make rent and they're worried about if their home's going to be blown up, invaded. Father, would you be with the Christians in Ukraine? Father, would you be with leadership? Father, would you be with our country? God, send a revival. We need your help so desperately. Help us to turn back to you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.